So does anyone here have grandparents out of state? Let me hear you. Does anyone here have grandparents out of the country? Beautiful. Uh, my, both of my parents are from northern Mexico, a city called Hermosillo. Uh, anyone from Hermosillo? Well, okay, okay, maybe. Yeah, great. So uh, my grandma on my dad's side of the family, her house, specifically her living room, looked more like a church than most churches. Uh, literally, there were Christmas lights all year round. And uh, when you first walked into the house, you turn left and there's an image of Our Lady of Guadalupe with Christmas lights and fake roses around the frame. And it was there all year. Uh, and then you turn to the left of that, and I kid you not, there is a life-size image of uh, Jesus, the divine mercy, where he's standing and the rays of light are coming from his side. You know, six foot, seven foot tall in her living room. Next to that was another huge image of Our Lady, Our Lady, not Guadalupe, another image of Our Lady. And there were uh, three images of Our Lady of Guadalupe in that living room. Then there was like a little infant Jesus, like a baby Jesus, life-size, in a wooden manger all year round. <laughs> More Christmas lights. <laughs> it was insane. Like, I don't know. And I, it just, it, I have so many fond memories of that space. Uh, my grandma would host, ever since one of my uncles died tragically, um, before I can remember, uh, she would gather people and friends and family and they'd pray the rosary every Friday. It was just tradition, it's just what they did. So when we went to Mexico to visit, we'd be praying the rosary on Fridays, which was chaos. Because <laughs> uh, my dad's from a family of seven and each of his siblings had uh, several kids. So on my dad's side alone, I calculated one day, I was trying to keep track and I still can't keep track, but I think I have something like 42 cousins on my dad's side. <laughs> then there's my mom who's from a family of eight. Anyways, I, I literally don't know how many cousins I have. Can't have enough of that. Wow. All right, so, um, Folks, family is such an essential part of who we are. It's how God made us to be. We're born from an exchange of persons, exchange of love. Most of us have um, not, not just the immediate family, we have extended family. Some of our families are small. Most of our families are complicated. All of our families are messy. In Psalm 133, King David writes, how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell as one. And I think there's something so true about that. When there is unity amongst siblings, I think of my siblings and we've had some beautiful moments. For example, when my sisters would play with their Barbies. And once or twice, they let me play with them. So I, I distinctly remember my mom got me a Ken doll. I don't know, you guys, you guys know what, who Ken is, right? There's Barbie and there's Ken. So my mom got me a Ken so that I could play with my sisters occasionally. They also had this Barbie van and so they're playing that the, bar, the family's going camping and they're, blah, 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 and they're just like, oh, now we're gonna stop to camp. And I'm like, okay, this is getting really boring. So I'm like, there are alligators! They're gonna eat the family! And my sisters very quickly uh, found something else to do. <laughs> um, my family, uh, were, my, both my parents are from Mexico, but, um, but I'm light-skinned. Uh, I guess we have a lot of European blood. My last name, Camus, somebody asked me earlier, they're like, what is that? Where's your family, where's your family from? And I'm like, well, my family's from Mexico. And they're like, well, what about your name? My name is French. Because in the 1700s, some French dude came to Mexico and made babies, and here we are. Uh, so uh, 
it's so, it's so fascinating. As much as I do have my own freedom, as much as you have your own freedom, so much of who we are is shaped by our family. And, and that fundamentally is part of how God made us in his own image. God himself is a, is a family. God is love. St. John writes in his first letter, not that God is loving, but God in himself is love. And if there's just one, if it's just a solitary individual, if, and a, if there's love without a community, that's called narcissism. <laughs> now, I can't fully explain to you how God is a triune, a unity of three persons, so perfectly united that it's one God. I can't fully explain that to you, but it makes a lot of sense. Because God in himself is a community, a family. There's an exchange of love. Some like to say it's the, it's, the, it's the lover, the beloved, and the love that's shared. I saw somebody with a t-shirt. There's a group of you with a t-shirt of, I'm not, I'm not, I shouldn't be referencing this, but there's a Spider-Man multiverse, and there's three Spider-Mans. So, yeah, no. But anyways, uh, it's a fun shirt. I love, I love the most recent editions of Spider-Man. <clears throat> okay, family. It's how God made us to be. It's where we can learn to love. We learn that we're not made for isolation. Which is why the last few years have been really traumatic for all of us. Some of us have suffered tremendously, some of us less. But we're not made for isolation, we're made for family, we're made for communion, it's how we grow and love. We're not made for narcissism because we're not made by a narcissistic God, we're made by a triune God. But our families are messy. And there's even, uh, there's, a, there's a deep, there's a depth of hurt that can come from those we're closest to. Precisely because we're closest to them. If I'm far, far away from a violent person, I'm not going to get hurt. And in a family, I'm not only close, but I open up my heart to them by loving. And that means when there's, there's an open heart, just a little jab can cut deep. There's one time my dad, whom I love tremendously, he's a good father, I was really blessed. He's very emotional, which always annoyed me. But uh, my mom's just like the rational, get things done, here we go. And my dad's like, oh, just give me a hug. Oh, mijito. And he just like squeezed me. I'm like, dad, let go of me now. Anyways, so one day, my loving father did something. I literally can't remember what he did, but something made me angry. At this point, I was in college seminary. Oh, I don't remember how many years ago. It was 14 years ago. I was in college, discerning priesthood, and my dad did something while we were in Mexico visiting family that made me really angry. And I had a chance to talk to him, to sit him down. I remember we were sitting in this, like, side room at my grandma's house that I've never used, but at that moment, I got a chance to sit down and be like, Dad, I want to talk to you. And he sat down. And I was so angry, my face was hot. And I expressed my anger to him. And as I'm like just telling him how he hurt me and what made me so angry about what he had done, I remember him sitting across from me like this. And that made me more angry. And I told him, it's like, you're, you're not listening to me. You never see how angry I am, how much you've hurt me? And I got so angry, I used a word that he didn't like. And so he interrupts me. He says, my son should never use that kind of language. Again, I got more angry. But I realized this conversation was going nowhere. 
Sometimes the people who know us the best hurt us because they don't fully understand us and we don't fully understand them, even though we live so close. Years later, well, I'll get to that in a second. Let me also say that in the scriptures, this brokenness of families is very present. One of my favorite passages of the Old Testament is very, very early on in the book of Genesis, chapter 37, you begin to hear of a young man named Joseph. And Joseph was deeply loved by his father, Israel. His father, Israel, loved Joseph best of all his sons, for he was the child of his old age, a.k.a. his youngest son. And he loved him so much, it says, he made him a long ornamented tunic, like a beautiful dress. I mean, not a dress, you know, like a, 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 his, a clothing that was remarkable. So even amongst his other brothers, he dressed differently because his father had given him the best clothes. It's like your, your parents having you shop out Walmart for your clothes, but then one of your siblings gets Gucci or something. Uh, not that I know brands. I just, I nobody wears a Gucci, right? Anyways, it would have stood out. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him best of all, they hated him so much that they could not say a kind word to him. Sound familiar? So broken, messy families is very, very real. Joseph was later on um, taken advantage of by his brothers. And they planned to kill him. One of the brothers, a more sensitive soul, said, let's not kill him. He's, a, he's our, you know, our, our brother. Uh, here's a, here's a, a ditch, a deep, deep, dried up cistern, a well. Let's just throw him in there. <laughs> I guess let him die to the elements? No, and the guy, Scripture says, he was thinking he'd come back later and take him out of there. So the brothers strip him of the robe, beat him up, throw him in this ditch. And then it says that they gathered and shared a meal together. I'm like, huh, good, he's in his place and we can help hang out. Then they see a caravan of people and uh, they decide, hey, why don't we sell our brother into slavery? You know, let's not kill our own flesh and blood, and we can make some money. They sell him into slavery. And the story is crazy. All that Joseph goes through. But somehow, Joseph, with all this betrayal, with all the physical harm, the hatred, the rejection, the aloneness. Now he's in a foreign country. No freedom. The book of Genesis says he, he had this great faith that God was with him. He also was given a real gift. He just had this simplicity. It says that the Lord was with Joseph, and when he was amongst the slaves... At one point, he uh, was recognized for his gifts. Later on, he's given uh, more authority, more position, and then he's falsely accused of a crime. This guy can't catch a break. He's imprisoned for the crime he didn't commit. And again, he sensed the Lord was with him. And he even won favor amongst the jailer and the jailer gave him a lot of responsibilities amongst the prisoners. <clears throat> then somebody has a dream, he's, he's able to interpret dreams, but every time he interprets the dreams, he says, only God can interpret dreams. He took no credit, but he knew God had given, this, given him this gift. So I don't know, it's just amazing to think to not lose hope despite the rejection, the violence, the enslavement. Joseph doesn't lose his confidence in the Lord. Something about that. Just a real 
a joyful conviction, something extraordinary. Dysfunction in our families is no cause for despair. Because you're not alone, you're not the only ones. All of our, me- our, all of our families are messy. But it's true that some are, are messier than others, that the dysfunction is, is worse in some cases. But it's no cause for shame, because here the scriptures, the living word of God gives us an example of what it can look like. I was really blessed with a tremendous moment I experienced a, few year, a couple years ago. It was, it was fairly recent, only two years ago or so. Where I told this story about my dad not having compassion for my anger. And I was kind of making the point like, hey, I love my dad, but you know, he messed up too. And, and then I was a jerk too. I didn't respect my own father. So there's still love, but even though there was lack of compassion and unfairness from my part, turns out my dad was at that mass and hears me telling this story in my homily. My dad, being the affectionate bear that he is, uh, usually comes into the sacristy, you know, after mass where the priest uh, changes their vestments. My dad, when he comes to my masses, which is every now and again, He'll come into the sacristy and come over and give me a big hug, and it's super annoying, but I love him. <laughs> On this occasion, he, when he heard me tell this story, he came into the sacristy, and I'm in one corner of the room, and I turn around. I'm like, hey, pops. And he stood at the opposite corner at the door, and he just was staring at me. It's like, some, this is weird. And then he took a couple steps forward and, and he looks at me and now I see there's, there's tears in his eyes. He says, I am so sorry. Now I'm uncomfortable. It's like, dad, don't worry about it. That was a, that was a long time ago, no big deal. Then he comes closer But still, no bear hug. He just comes real close. And he just says, can you forgive me? Like, genuinely asking if it's possible for me to forgive him. At this point, I'm shaken. I'm like, yeah, Dad, I I forgive you. And I give him a big hug. Thankfully, that wrapped up, and I get in my car, and I'm driving back home because I, I, uh, at that time, wasn't living at that church, and I just start to weep. I'm by myself in the car, and I'm weeping, and I, it, the, it felt, I had this feeling like there was a stone in my heart that was beginning to melt, and my thought was this. Is it possible that my dad loves me more than I realize? We need family. We need those connections. Like even Jason was telling us how the opposite of addiction, and there's, addiction isn't just a, a substance abuse or use of pornography or other bad habits. Addiction, we all have addiction to sin. We tend towards it. We tend to choose and want sin. We're addicted to it. And the opposite of addiction is not being free of it, being plastic and fake. <laughs> the opposite of addiction is connection, communion, because that's what we're made for. That's what annihilates the lies that I'm alone, the lie that I, I can't, the lie that I'm unwanted. It's in communion of persons that we know that we're loved, that we're chosen, that we're not set aside, but rather set apart for special relations. So whether this is your family or, the, or it's others, friendships, 
we need that connection. And we must be willing to accept the messiness that comes with relationships. Despite the shortcomings of our families, whether it's immediate family or others, the Lord has placed others in our life. And these, this communion of family is meant to be a school of love where we grow in love of God. How do you help a lukewarm Catholic parent who doesn't desire to grow in faith and community? You know, we're here at this conference learning a little bit about our faith, growing in that. Yeah. What do we do when mom or dad uh, are not... They're not there. They're, yeah. they're culturally Catholic. W what are the steps we take in that relationship? Good. It's, it's one of those moments where you can feel uh, strange. Like my parents are the ones who are supposed to be teaching me the faith. And yet now my faith is stronger than my parents. That can be kind of a strange, in, in a real way, you have to acknowledge that there's something kind of painful about that. So I would say one is, is just acknowledge that, you know, that something's kind of, it feels off. So it's okay to, to kind of be bothered or hurt by that. But, um, so you also need to respect that this is still your parent. And it's going to be hard for them to take advice from you, perhaps. But just like with anybody else, I think that ultimately the solution is just like with anybody else that doesn't practice the faith. You, you invest the time and energy to get to know where they're at. And then just... We can't impose the faith, we can only propose it. So I think you can do that with your parents. If they're not practicing the faith or there's a particular parent who's lukewarm, don't try to impose and change them, but propose, hey, I'm gonna be going to mass today. Uh, are you not gonna be, I wanna pray the rosary, do you wanna join me? And be okay with them saying no, because your witness is powerful. And we've seen this many times, right? Where a lot of teens help their parents to conversion. So uh, there is a grace that God is going to give you in that, but yeah. Yeah, I want to echo that as far as proposing rather than imposing. Don't underestimate the power of invitation, patient invitation, yeah. right? So if you're going to Mass every week, hey, do you want to come to Mass with me? And even if they're like, no, not this week, I got stuff going on. Okay. Next week, do you want to go to Mass with me? Do you want to, do you want to pray together? I mean, like, and always never getting upset. But in experiences I have of young people helping their mom or dad come to the faith, that's where it was. It was that continued patient invitation. And then one week, it always happens, the Holy Spirit, right, convicts their heart. And they're like, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, go, I'll go to Mass with you this week. And then after Mass, there's a conversation over breakfast. Why, why do you believe this stuff? You know, like, and then some really cool things can happen. Absolutely. Patient invitation. Yeah. You talked about that story with your dad, which was so cool, uh, where he came and said, can you forgive me? Yeah. How do we forgive a parent or a family member when they haven't asked for forgiveness? You know, that was a beautiful moment of reconciliation, but we don't always get that. That's right. How do we proceed forward in those circumstances? Yeah. And let me acknowledge too that like the story I told of my dad, again, it was probably a pretty petty hurt. I mean, not totally petty, but yeah, uh, something that is easier to forgive perhaps and, or <laughs> forgotten, obviously I clearly forgot what it was. And there are hurts. Sometimes we are hurt from family members in a way that's bad, real bad, perhaps even traumatizing. So I just want to reverence that there are deeper hurts than just like, oh, let's hug it out or I just want an apology from you. There's also deeper hurts. So whether it's, it's I need an apology and the person isn't willing, that's one thing. Forgiveness is something that you have to, that, that, that frees me. When I forgive, I'm free. To reconcile a relationship is different when then there's also the they're sorry and now we're in better relationship again. So forgiveness is first. I have to forgive in my heart. I have to see the, um, my family with love, with some level of compassion. Um, so that's one. Forgiving your heart, and sometimes you might need to beg Jesus to help you with that. And these things can only happen in God's time. Like even this simple story that I told, it was years between the argument I had with my dad and him apologizing. Never talked about it in between, and it happened. So hold on to the hope that God can do great things, because he's the one who moves hearts, never us. 
But when it comes to the more traumatic stuff, the heavier hurts, uh, things that are really hard to forgive or, or still have affected you, that's a bit different. Um, and to that, I, I would just want to give an encouragement of um, there's a need for you to seek healing. Sometimes there can be healing from the uh, reconciliation. But in some heavier stuff, you need, to, you need to get help. You need to ask somebody for help, whether it's a youth minister or, um, or, other, or another trusted adult, and for them to be able to listen and, and help you discern what kind of help you need. I think that's just really important to name. Yeah, that's important. I think and it kind of leads into another question that I want to get to you as well, right. which will echo. Um, I think what helps me, and I think this helps me understand the sacrament of confession too, but since you're here, you can correct me if I want to be like, no, Joel, that's the wrong way to understand it. <laughs> um, is that like, when we talk about reconciliation, right? That's a process and reconciliation breaks down like this. There's a harm committed, a sin, a fault. We hurt somebody else. We break a relationship with others or God. But then, and you talked about this, uh, there is contrition. I feel sorry that I did that thing. And wow, I shouldn't have done the thing. And then I ask for forgiveness. I'm sorry. Because right, you can feel sorry, but not say you're sorry. And then there's forgiveness. And then there's some sort, and then there's forgiveness given, and then there's some sort of restitution for that thing. I'm going to do something to make it right. But that's the sacrament of reconciliation. Sin, contrition, I'm sorry, I confess my sins, I'm sorry for my sins. I'm forgiven, absolution, and then penance. What are we going to do to make it right, right? You can take any of those parts out of that process. I can say I'm sorry and not be forgiven. I can be forgiven without somebody ever saying they're sorry. I can commit a sin and make restitution for it without asking forgiveness. Like I, I smashed pumpkins once when I was a high schooler. Terrible thing to do. Don't smash people's pumpkins. I felt so bad about smashing these pumpkins. I went to the house of the person whose pumpkins we smashed and I gave them money, but I told them my friends had done it. Uh, so sin close. committed, penance, Nothing in the middle. <laughs> we were not reconciled. I was not reconciled to those people. What I'm saying is you can, it is possible to forgive people who never say they're sorry. And sometimes we need to do that. One of the questions that's in here, which we'll touch on briefly is what if somebody has been physically or sexually abusive to me in my family? And I think um, if you find yourself in that situation, what, how do we approach that? Because you touched on a little bit of that healing, but I want to explicitly name those things since they're here. If we've experienced that, what's the step forward there? It happens a lot. It's not, first of all, it's, it's something so horrific, such a nightmare to consider that kind of abuse, especially within the family. But it's real. There's real evil. And sometimes it's, again, if we're all created in God's image and likeness, we're all created good, all evil from humans it's, it's evil that's being done by someone who's actually good, but they've chosen evil. They've chosen to, to, de to deprive themselves and others of the good. So when there is something like sexual, physical, violent abuse, the most loving thing you can do is report it. Because that good soul who has chosen evil for healing to take place needs to face the consequences of their evil. And the victim doesn't need to hold any hatred. The victim doesn't have to say um, they're bad. By reporting abuse, uh, you're not doing anything unloving. But it sure can feel really bad, especially if you do care for, the, for someone who's caused harm. Uh, it can feel like such a betrayal to report it. That's where it's just so important to, to, not, to not be alone in that. Like, like, again, Jason said, our minds are like scary neighborhoods. You don't go in there alone. Same with abuse. It's such a, it, 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 can, it affects the heart so much. It just turns like it turns your heart into a tornado. You can't see what sways up. So to just have someone enter and open up to somebody who can walk you through that, uh, help you journey through to that kind of abuse. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think it, that's a really well said. And 
if you're finding yourself in that situation where that's happened in the past and you've not shared that with somebody or that's happening currently, I want to encourage you to talk to your youth minister, chaperones, group leaders, so they can walk you through that situation. Hear me when I say this. Hear us when we say this. There is nothing you did that warranted that situation. Nothing you did that caused that, okay? There's nothing that happened, nothing you said. You might be like, well, I kind of deserved it. No, 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 no. Nothing you did made you deserve that, whatever the response was. Sometimes we can feel that guilt like, oh, but, but I kind of, no. Let me put that out of your mind. It, it, and like, nothing begets violence. Nothing bege and, and so just know that. And that again, going forward brings healing and hope. I think in that process of reconciliation too, the other thing I'll say is sometimes we work through that process and there's this phrase, maybe you've heard it before, forgive and forget. I don't like it. <laughs> we can't ever forget. Yeah. You know, like those, and we can move on and be reconciled, forgive and reconcile. But sometimes in these situations, you may find that forgiving is remembering and that reconciliation maybe means relationships change or there's boundaries and that's okay. Um, because that's ultimately sometimes. What yeah. And this might to apply to other questions as well, where I think healing is remembering differently. Yeah. Yeah. Where I've seen so many uh, victims, even like exposure to pornography is a real form of abuse especially when it comes to others intentionally. And um, there's one story that Father Sean Kilcali likes to share about a young, a young boy, a teenager, who shared his experience. And he, uh, Father Sean asked him, like, remember, go back to that memory when you were first exposed and ask, tell me, where do you think Jesus was? If he was in the room, where would he, where would he be? And he said, well, Jesus was probably in the corner far from me. And he said, and what do you think Jesus was doing? What do you think he was like? How do you picture him? And he said, Jesus was probably arms crossed, really disappointed and angry. And Father Sean just had to say, I'm sorry. There's no way that's the case. You were 11 years old. You had no idea what the effects of this were going to be. You had an, a whole mixture of emotions. There's no way Jesus was standing back. Jesus would have been right there by your side. And he was angry, angry at the porn, angry at the people who had made this opportunity for exposure possible. And he probably would have embraced you and just kept repeating, I'm so sorry this has happened to you. I love you so much. I am so sorry this has happened to you. I love you. I am so sorry this has happened to you. And that young boy decided, started to cry. This teenager started to cry in Father Sean's office. And that memory of, of, of his trauma, he started to remember differently. That's great. I think, it, and hopping off that, you said trauma. There was a, a couple questions about this, which I think are really good um, that I'd love to hop in on with as well. But how do you, and I think you have a unique perspective on this too, as a priest who has a, a parish family. If you come from an environment where you have uh, experienced trauma within your family, not the best home life, maybe not great parent, it could be any number of things, but you want to have a family of your own someday. How do you not let the past define your future? And there are a couple of questions like that, which I think are really insightful, wonderful questions to ask. And I think just asking the question and having that desire is the first step. What do you uh, think? Th there's so many things I, I could say. Uh, I'm just going to proclaim to you the truth that we profess as Catholics of redemption. At the Easter vigil, the night before we celebrate, the night of Easter, the church has this ancient hymn that she sings called the Exalted. And in that you hear, O happy fall, O blessed sin of Adam, original sin. The church blesses original sin, which has caused all the evil, all the moral evil of humanity. And the church blesses that, that the trauma on human existence. Oh, happy fall. Why? It says, this sin, oh gosh, not my train of thought. Um, 
Oh, happy fall, that with, without which we would not have had this loving Savior. I forget, there's, there's something more beautiful than that in that, but the, the teaching of redemption is this, that God, his response to evil is the kind of response that transforms the evil and makes things better than if there had never been the evil. This is a, it's, one, it's, it's the craziest teaching I think we have as Catholics. It's redemption, that he gives new value even to evil. And the epitome of that is the cross we have over here. Jesus' wounds in his hands, his side, and his feet, that's evil. They did this to a man who was innocent, and he wasn't just an innocent man, he was God himself, full of love. And they tortured him, and the wounds were the supreme witness of that evil. And God's response to that evil, what was it? Oh, gee, well, that sucks. Like, why don't we, uh, I'll raise him from the dead and it'll all be good again. That's like giving you ice cream after trauma. Doesn't, no amount of ice cream, no amount of reward makes up for the evil. What is God's response? God takes those wounds and he says, okay, I'm going to take those wounds and make them the fountain of mercy. It is those wounds precisely where I'm going to manifest my love in a way that I couldn't have otherwise. And I'm going to make those wounds something that people can reverence and hold up. And so people who have experienced wounds in relationships and families, somehow God is going to bless that. And it's going to take it some time, and he's going to invite you into that process. But he can redeem your wounds and make things better than, they, than if they had never occurred. I'll give you another example that we've all shared here. And, and it, it's, it's people like Jason. Jason Everett is an amazing speaker who's helping heal and deliver people from addiction. And he's doing that precisely because he's experienced, he's suffered the pain and God redeemed that in him. He can do the same for you and greater things still. You and I need to believe that and claim that. That's uh, one, I love that you got up to preach that. That's great you got up to preach that actually, thank you. <clears throat> Whenever I do these things, I feel like 75% of the time, people get up out of their seat and start talking. Noel was very reserved, and I appreciated that. We sat <laughs> and had a great conversation. I want to highlight something you said because I don't want you to miss it. The glorified body of Jesus, the resurrected body, still bears the wounds of the crucifixion. That is a worthy of our reflection. Why? That didn't need to be the case, right? right. Like Jesus resurrected from the dead in his glorified body, he didn't need to be raised from the dead with, with wounds in his hands and in his feet and in his side. The glorified body still bears the marks of Jesus Christ. And just to echo what you said, where we come from, God can use those things to bring good. God never wills evil. God never causes evil to bring good. So don't be like, oh, God made that bad thing happen so he could bring good. No, 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 no. That's not the way God works. But in evil, God can bring good out of it. Your story about Joseph, too, as you were talking, how does the story of Joseph and his brother end? He, he saves them. He saves and them. And then he says, what you meant for evil, God turned to good. Yeah. So, but reflect on that. Maybe tonight during adoration, if you're experiencing trauma or some of these struggles, reflect on the wounds of Christ. I want to make sure we don't lose that and highlight that. Excellent. Last one. Let's do this last question. Great. How do we deal maybe with feelings of feeling unwanted or like we don't belong in our family? Now this is, I'm combining a couple of questions here. So I'm gonna give you a couple scenarios. I just feel like my whole family is super religious and I'm not as religious. I don't feel like I fit. Or my whole family is not religious. I'm religious, I don't fit. Um, I was adopted. I'm just trying to figure out how, how to just get over the wound of my birth parents giving me up for adoption and feeling unwanted there. And just plain, my family doesn't get me and I don't belong. How do I move forward in those circumstances when there's, there's hurt like, I don't fit here. I don't fit in this family. How do we step forward in that? To step forward, you got to step in, right? You mm -hmm. got you to lean into that precise question. Because if we're honest, 
we don't usually think of that, that I, we don't acknowledge I feel unwanted. We tend to be like, I hate my dad, or man, I can't stand that person, or I'm just so angry about everything, or I'm apathetic, I don't, I don't care about anything. Those are all the fruits or the kind of the aftermath of what's actually at the bottom of that. The lie that I'm unwanted. So Jesus can shine light. If you feel off, you got to ask him, Jesus, what's at the root of this? Where's this coming from? Why do I feel so apathetic? Or why am I so angry? Why am I so scared? Why am I so sad? Ask him. He shines light into the darkness. He wants you to recognize what's the lie you've come to believe. In this case, the lie that I'm unwanted. And you need to step into that. Not run from it. Not try to push it away or say it's not a big deal. Step into it. And there you can bring Jesus. And he can transform it. He can redeem it. He can do something with that, regardless of the circumstances. Yeah, that's great. I think the last kind of note I'll put on here is well said, and this was a wonderful workshop and, and challenging things. You said at the beginning, we all come from a family. That's a part of our lives. And it's an ir 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 we can't erase it. It's irreversible. Like your family tree, those are your roots. They don't go away. Um, how we live with that and work with that is important. I guess the last piece I would sort of put to punctuate with that as you're digging through some of these things is to never underestimate the value of a counselor or therapy. Uh, these are healthy, good things. And sometimes we might be in situations where you're like, I'm really wrestling with the fact that I'm adopted and the feeling that my birth parents don't want me um, is challenging. That's a great place sometimes to wrestle with a therapist. And having somebody outside of ourselves, a spiritual director, if you're going to look for a counselor or therapist, a Catholic counselor, a Christian counselor or therapist is great. Or somebody who at least respects your faith um, and can speak into it from that angle. Uh, but these are wonderful things to help through some of the heavier topics we've talked about. Because sometimes your mind is, is tough and going in there alone can be challenging without a doubt. So... I, that's my final encouragement, that maybe that would be a good thing for you. I have seen a therapist. I think that that's been a very healthy, good thing for me, and I think it is for a lot of people. So just offering that encouragement. Yeah. As we close, would you bless us? Yeah. Whenever there's a priest in the house, I'm like, give me a blessing, Father. And I would love for that. Uh, for yeah, thanks again, Joel, for your own vulnerability. And um, uh, through seminary, I've had a formation director, a spiritual director, and even as a priest, I've, I've received counseling, so I can't... I, I totally echo that there's such a gift in bringing others in. So let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.